Welcome to Energy Factor Fiction with your host, John Gibson. Welcome to Energy Factor Fiction. I'm John Gibson. Uh, we have a show where we're really trying to bring you some facts about energy and all facets of energy, whether it be wind or batteries or uh, solar. Uh, we, we're taking a look at the totality of the energy landscape. And so today, I'm really happy to have with me uh, Dan Piet as a guest. Dan, good to have you here. It's good to be back. Well, we were going to start you out with a test right away. One of the reasons I like talking to you, Dan, is because you seem to be really knowledgeable about a really broad range of, of topics. So what do you do in order to, to have that kind of knowledge, that kind of depth of, of understanding for so many different topics? Partly it's reading. I think that if you don't keep up with current events, I read three newspapers every day, I read two or three magazines every month, and uh, I believe that's time well spent. I read a lot of nonfiction. I don't think as much as you, but I read a lot of nonfiction and I read a lot of fiction. But in addition to that, what I've discovered over the past about two years is podcasts, and I think those are fantastic. Well, I, I did a podcast last week. We'll, we'll decide if it's fantastic or not after I get the feedback. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I found something else that I've done. My grandkids are sort of keeping me uh, young. Mm -hmm. um, they're learning. Here they are, 10, 11 years old, and they're taking online courses to learn Python or to learn Julia. Uh, so they're, to learn R. I mean, they, mm -hmm. these kids are like mathematically astute at age when I was still trying to find out if I could hit a guy with a dodgeball. <laughs> so uh, I've, I've been sort of looking at the internet and one of my favorite places is Coursera. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you familiar with the range of topics they teach there? I've seen some of those and it's just astounding and it's, it's a dedication, right? Because it's more than just a half hour listen, it's a, it's a whole course worth of, uh, of uh, information. It, it's cool. I mean, it, you can take 10 courses and get a certification mm -hmm. as an IT specialist and for, for Google products and other things. I mean, it's just an enormous amount of information gathered in, in one place. And uh, I just out of curiosity, you know what it, what it cost? It's free, isn't it? It's, it's not quite free. It's free for the first seven days. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's kind of like buy one, get one free if okay. you pay that additional price for mm -hmm. shipping that you mm -hmm. see on every commercial. <laughs> but it, it actually, if you, if you enroll, it appears to be $49 a month mm -hmm. for an unlimited amount of coursework a, across that. And when you look, they have a, just an incredible library that ranges from deep learning to mm -hmm. Python to neural networks, to IT certifications with tools. And so you can really stay abreast of a rapidly changing world by just simply getting online and spending about $600 a year. Mm -hmm. yeah, compare that to college tuition. Oof. Yeah, it's important too because as we grow in the industry, and I think we've talked about this in the past, is we need to embrace the new technology. And if you don't understand it, in my background, I used to talk to oil and gas executives, the biggest barrier was these people not understanding what could be done. And when you can come in and show them and they just get all defensive, but once you have taken courses in how this stuff works, whether it's deep learning or neural nets or artificial intelligence, that gives you an insight into, into what solutions are available. Well, it's not nearly so difficult when you spend a little bit of time, you know, understanding sort of the simplest parts of it, right? I mean, I'm certainly not a neural networks expert, but uh, having, you know, sort of taken a course, mm -hmm. you, you can understand the, the jargon. Uh, you can understand the concepts, and I think it makes you a better decision maker, particularly at the CEO level. You know, we've got some really great CEOs in the energy industry and oil and gas industry, mm -hmm. guys like uh, Tim Dubb at Pioneer, mm -hmm. where you know you know Tim is a an MIT grad, and and he he is exemplary of what you would expect would come from that institution, right? Yeah. It, the people that he hires, the way he thinks about technology, sort of the catalyst that he is for technology in the industry. And so I, I, I've not talked to Tim about it, but my guess is that he's also a lifelong learner. And I, I think that's true, and you can see the companies that have done really well through the downturn, and people that have, the companies that have been able to capitalize on when opportunities come up are those individuals that are led by people with, a, with insight and the ability and the desire to keep learning. It's, and it's not work for me. I mean, I don't think it is for you either. No. We, it, it's an infinite amount of curiosity mm -hmm. says I, I can read nearly anything. Mm -hmm. I, we were looking at a paper that I, or a paragraph I'd written on sort of uh, hydrophobic versus hydrophilic behavior mm -hmm. for, for fluids and 
it, it's just, it's knowing about nanotechnology. It's knowing about the, the ability to put that there. So you, you read the newspaper and three magazines a month. Now, Dan, I figured you for like a 30 magazine a month guy, but what, what's your favorite sort of fiction that, that keeps you sort of yeah, active. I, I read a lot of fiction as yeah. well. I hate to talk about that on energy. Yeah. It's what gives me energy. Yeah, me too. I love historical fiction. I mean, you know, and, and, and that's always entertaining uh, some of the old spy, spy novels and things like that. Currently, I am in a book group with some really intelligent guys. I'm the youngest guy in that book group by about 15 years. And we read everything from very modern stuff. We're reading a book called Asymmetry right now. Tannerbaum, I think Lisa Holiday is the name of the author, and this is just came out this year. You wouldn't have expected this from a bunch of retired lawyers, right? But it's it's really interesting, all the way back to old Philip Roth and and uh, books like that. So a wide we could call it a Catholic range and a, a Catholic no. range. Uh, well, you know, I, it, it's odd. I uh, read poetry, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm reading Shelley and mm -hmm. Blake. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you go, so why would that be important? And you, I, for some reason, um, understanding emotions, understanding people, uh, exploring you know, the, the totality of ourselves, sort of, I think makes us better people. I agree with that. And the other interesting thing about poetry, especially when you read it out loud, is you see that free song between just the sound of the words that aren't necessarily the meaning, but it kind of in, inculcates itself into your whole being. Well. Uh, my, my son tolerated me reading to him haiku when huh. he was a young fellow and he, he went to school and they were teaching him about it and he said, oh, you don't need to teach me about this. My father lays on the couch and reads <laughs> to us one weekend. And so, I mean, we, in order for us to sort of keep up, we sort of engage in things most people maybe not, maybe wouldn't. But it, it causes us, even in the energy industry, it, uh, there was a, a guy named Jerry Cranus who we used to bring in back in at, at Landmark, who, uh, if you can remember Jerry, and he really sort of talked about the complexity of people mm -hmm. and how we seek out people with similar complexity. So it, it tends to make lifelong relationships when you mm -hmm. find people that have not the same interest, but have an interest in being interested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you and I have sort of been together for quite a long time well, because we're, we're interested mm -hmm. in being interested. So. Yeah, appreciate, uh, Dan, your, your comments on that, and we will be right back after a break. How is Houston doing in innovation? Find out when we come back. Welcome back to Fact or Fiction. Uh, John Gibson, your host, and we have Dan Piet. And uh, since we're here in the great city of Houston, which I consider to be sort of the energy capital of the world, and it's becoming the innovation capital of the world. We thought we'd give you a, a few comments on highlights on the city of Houston. And Dan, you're, you and uh, Doreen are highly integrated into the city. What, what do you think we're doing here that's right to yeah. in, inspire innovation? Doreen's my wife and much more integrated than I am. And yeah. I, I gain a lot of, uh, of insight and connections because of her, which is wonderful. And I'm really excited to see how the city is now approaching innovation. I would say that this started when we got rejected by Amazon. I think it was a shock to the city and, and it wasn't a shock to any of us that are looking around and see what Amazon's looking for, but they said, we want to give them the Exxon building. We want to give them the KBR campus. We want to give them the old Sears building with no integration between it. The thing that, but that makes a city innovative is the ability to take a group of disparate industries and connect them. Because as we've talked about it just in the last segment and before is you see a lot of productivity when you integrate different things? Well, it's, you know, if we take a look at some of the most inspiring startups in the energy industry today, oil and gas, we're seeing CRISPR being used to identify paleo microbes in order to determine where uh, the, the fractures that we're creating are, are coming from, where the fluids are coming from. So we are seeing that sort of integration of medical technologies and, and DNA sequencing go right into the energy industry. But that's also the integration of Silicon Valley and in Texas. I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot of effort from, from Silicon Valley to be in the energy sector. Absolutely, and, and what you love to see is with what they're calling the innovation corridor, which is going from downtown to the old Sears building, which is now, which has always been owned by Rice, but they're turning that into an incubator, into Rice University itself, all the way down to the medical center. And what they're calling TMCX, or the, the startup area that the medical center is funding for a lot of medical 
uh, startups, but they're, they're going outside that as well. By getting more of these people lined up and making it easy to get between these, bicycles would be good. <laughs> I, uh, I think that it's really productive and it's going to make a difference in the city to get, to get all these things integrated. Like a, there's uh, silicon chips coming out of Rice University. There's a company called Microsilica that has built a chip that you stick in the stream of an oil well and it tells you what the constituents are coming out. They're specifically looking for asphaltine. So once the asphaltine number comes up, you can close the well down and do a workover. Now that's a good example of what you can do with a, with a silicon chip, with a MEMS chip. I, I think it's, it's pretty cool that Houston's involved in it. We also have University of Houston, which is probably one of the largest inner city universities uh, in, in the world today, mm -hmm. and uh, I think they're closing in on graduating 10,000 students a year there, and mm -hmm. they also are looking at startups and incubation and encouraging the kids there. We, we see it, every university is sort of beginning to get into how do you help your graduates be entrepreneurs rather than just employees. And as we've seen, the research and development in the oil and gas industry has come down over years. Uh -huh. We've seen the oil, the oil field service companies, Schlumberger's, the Halliburton, they've reduced their spending on research and development. And it's created this sort of vacuum. We're seeing an explosion of these startup yeah. companies, in my opinion, yeah. that are filling in that vacuum. And having a city and, and a mayor, I mean, I'm actually quite impressed with Sylvester Turner and, and sort of the vision for how are we going to do that here so that we create new ideas, new technology right here in Houston that are good for medical, good for aerospace, good for the energy industry, the financial and the banking industry. I mean, we have, I think, a lot of energy around that in the city. We really do, and, and I love to see the fact that we're trying to keep as many of these recent graduates here in town with these opportunities. U of H, uh, U of H downtown, you see a lot of these people that are saying, how do I fit into this ecosystem? How do I, I have an idea to start a company. All I need is a desk. I need a desk and a computer. And coupled with what we said in the last segment, the lifelong learning. So now I need to know what's going to happen next time in, in whatever language it is, whatever machine learning tools that are out there. And by creating an environment where this is encouraged and funded, we're getting more VC firms here in town, we're getting more venture and private equity money coming in from outside of town. That to me is what's exciting. That's what makes Houston a great place. Well, it's, uh, you know, I, I stay involved with a lot of these companies sort of mentoring or mm -hmm. helping or, uh, and it's one of the things that's pretty exciting too is the uh, University of Houston, if we go back, they were sort of one of the pioneers in superconductivity. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, we see a superconducting company that's a startup here in town, and we may be 10 years away from commerciality of, of superconductors in a large way, but they've taken that technology from what they call high temperature, which is the temperature of liquid nitrogen, yeah. to, to where there's a future for room temperature. And that changes the grid, it changes the electrification of everything if we're able to achieve yeah. room temperature superconductors. And, and I think Houston's gonna be involved in that commercialization, that technology, and, and it's the path we should be on as a city for investing in the future. Absolutely, we need to look at that. I mean, you think of room temperature superconductors, batteries, if nothing else, it's gonna be a tremendous change in that, which means that alternative energy becomes a lot more realistic than we've ever seen before. So it's, a, it's an exciting time to be here. We, I mean, I've enjoyed Houston. Houston has gone through ups and downs. We've seen it recently, and uh, you and I both lived through it in the, in the 80s, which was a painful time to be here, and yet nobody really gave up. Nobody gave up. Well, it's, it's kind of fun to look at the equity on your home as it rises <laughs> and falls here in Houston, along with the uh, oil cycle. But, yeah. you know, you, you take a look at uh, superconductors and you look at batteries and you look at the grid and you just go, we have to innovate yes. in, in Texas for the world uh, because the whole battery idea of sort of buffering, it, it sort of is not, it's not what I think is optimum, right? What would be the coolest is if we had flexible power generation so we didn't need to buffer it. We generated what we needed at on peak demand. and on demand. And, and you go, the natural resources tied up in batteries, the complexity of putting these in, the disposal of materials at later points, recycling, all that could be avoided if we got a lot smarter about the generation of, of flexible power. And so I'm, I'm excited about some of the activities I see in the city that are looking at that, that capability. 
I've seen people working on uh, micro turbines. So think of your neighborhood as putting its own generator in. So all of a sudden now you lose, you don't have to worry about transmission losses. You have a, a generator stuck right in your neighborhood and they're small, they're quiet, and they generate enough electricity for 50, 100, 500 houses. When, you, when we think about fuel cells and other things, distributed power changes the planet and really mm -hmm. attacks energy poverty globally. And so you just go, it is, is we're investing in sort of a distributed network of energy creation, it's ex exciting to see how that changes the quality of life for people all over the planet. I looked at an illumination map for sub-Saharan Africa the other day, and one way to know the quality of life for people is to simply look at a, a map of light at night, and every place that it, it looks as though it could be the ocean, uh, but it's on a continent, you can assume that they don't have enough electricity to even read by uh, from a, a 100 watt bulb in the evenings. And so we, we can change that by innovation here and, and I, I just think it's, it's an exciting time I and mean, we're in an exciting city. Yeah. So both of us think it's super cool and I just hope that a lot of people will find a way to get involved, whether it's through investments, whether if you're a, an executive, it's through coaching, uh, it's, it's helping these people, but really being a part of this city and supporting the direction that's going on innovation. And I think you and I are there. Okay. Sounds, sounds good. Well, thanks very much, and uh, we'll see you in a moment. Can a Democrat be pro-energy? We talk energy and politics next. Well, welcome back to uh, Energy Factor Fiction. And uh, Dan, we've been talking today, and I, there's another thing about you that I find fascinating. We're in an industry that's pretty conservative, and I suspect you're a Democrat. Is that true? I voted in the Democratic primary. Many times or Many just times. once? Many times. Many so times. So what, what causes a Democrat to be so pro-energy and in this sector, that's not what you'd think. Or are there that many of you and we just don't talk about it? I think they're more than you believe, and I don't think that energy has a party. Uh, I believe that it is important to provide energy for the country, and it's important to provide it as responsibly as possible, and we have an obligation to do what we know how to do. Well, as, as you know, I've been apolitical for a long time. I just, I don't like either party, mm -hmm. or <laughs> it's a, I, I'm sort of a, uh, not, not my idea. I, I found it to be in, our, in the best interest as CEO of large companies to be able to work with whatever administration w was in office to try to maximize the quality of life for our customers and for our employees and for our vendors. And so I've, I've tried to be sort of neutral. So I, I normally don't talk about a party because I really don't belong to one. It gives my wife a great deal of frustration. She would, would choose, <laughs> uh, choose for me if she could. But, uh, and it, it causes me to, if you watched me watch the news, you would see me continuously changing from one channel to the next because I'm, I'm finding that we're really trying to polarize the nation yeah. through the news today as opposed to solve problems like energy. Is that? Is that a fair? I don't disagree with that. I think the country is in, in a very polarizing position. It isn't, it isn't as if we haven't been here before. I mean, you can take the entire 1850s when we were going through the Kansas Compromise, the Missouri Compromise, and trying to figure out a way to get through the, that part of the, the um, country's history without killing everybody, which we failed. I don't think we're at that level. But I do believe that the media does sometimes take really strong sides, one side or the other. And it's, it's disconcerting because we should be coming up when looking for solutions and not just pointing fingers. So you think it's unfair to stereotype the Democratic Party as being anti-oil and gas? I think there are a lot of Democrats in the oil and gas party. And I think that as a general rule, one of the problems we face is that we have parties that are so separate. You can't, for example, be anti-abortion and pro-gun control. That's just not a bucket that you can fit into. You can't be pro-environment and pro-energy. And so these things are important that we need to find a way to, to bring these together, but through the media as part of it, but I also think through party leaders. If you look at a Nancy Pelosi or a, a Hillary Clinton, they get a lot of scorn, but I think that 
President Trump and, and his cohorts do as well. And so you, you need to find a way, I would like to find a way where we have a compromise in this. We need to take care of people in this country. We need to take care of the least fortunate in our country. And we, we, you and I have talked about that past. And at the same time, we need to encourage free enterprise. It's not an either or situation in my mind. In my you know, I, I speak a lot. People will ask me a question just to try to figure it out. And I would often have said, uh, everybody raise your hand if you believe that all people deserve a, a reasonable quality of health care. Mm. And then uh, when they get done, you'll find that every hand's raised. And you know you're probably 50-50 or so in the audience between you know, Republicans and Democrats. And now we have to include libertarians and others there because they're growing numbers, mm -hmm. particularly amongst younger people. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you do that and then you say, you know, is there some reasonable amount that we should be expected to pay for that health care? And now we know we have a right, right decision, mm -hmm. affordable and everyone. Mm -hmm. And so how do you get the teeter-totter to balance out? It's not should we not do it or should we do it? And we tend to make everything right and wrong as opposed to right, right in, in our decision making. And so right, wrong is, uh, yeah, I can't kill you. Uh, I hadn't even wanted to, Dan, but uh, uh, it's at the, at the same time, you know, we tend to drive everything towards uh, a right, wrong, and our media is, is causing that to be even a greater effort. It just is appalling, actually. It's just hard to watch almost anything anymore. I agree, and I also think that you're starting, starting to see segments of the population fall into rent-seeking and value creation, and I'd put a lot of the big companies into rent-seeking. If you look at Big Sugar, for example, they're picking your pocket every month. Every time you buy a candy bar, that's going into Big Sugar's pocket. You look at companies that, uh, cable companies, that they're using the government to make sure you don't have a choice. And that's not free enterprise. I mean, it, it appalls me when I see companies like the alcohol distributors here in Texas that say, I'm free enterprise, I'm all about the free market. And yet what happens is the government says, John, you can't buy a bottle of wine unless it gets, unless it gets distributed through Silver Eagle distributors. It's putting money in their pocket. And that, to me, is offensive. Well, now, Dan, I, have, I wouldn't say I'll go that far. <laughs> I find every business will use any, anything available to them to, uh, to improve the profitability and the generation of wealth for their shareholders. And so we do need regulations and common sense and other things there. But I, I do hope we can drive people towards the ethical dilemma solutions where we understand we trade off between truth and loyalty, short-term, long-term, group and individual, and justice and mercy. And those are really right, right things sure. as opposed to the way we try to draw them as, as right, wrong. There's a lot of work to do, but uh, the good part is I'm, I'm unaffiliated and you're, you are affiliated and we still are able to have a, a good conversation and I, I appreciate the diversity of opinion you bring down, so thank you. We answer viewer questions after the break. Well, welcome back to Energy Factor Fiction. John Gibson with Dan Piet. And uh, we had several really good deep conversations. One of them generated a question from the audience, though, Dan, is how about naming one Democratic uh, uh, candidate or, or somebody in office that actually likes energy? Well, I think that's a little unfair question. Let's look at it slightly differently and say which Democrats have been successful in oil and gas and which ones still are working in oil and gas and how do we move ahead? And I would point immediately to Bill White, our previous mayor of Houston, who was the CEO of Wedge Group, which had a number of seismic companies in their portfolio and a number of other things. And then if you look at Andrew White, who is running for governor, he's in a, a runoff, today happens to be the the, uh, the uh, runoff election for him. I think that he's very much pro-energy because he's been in a number of companies. I think Beto is, is also pro-energy. And I think obviously I'm playing to the Texas politicians because so much of Texas's revenue comes from energy. You'd be hard pressed to get a Democratic official out of the state who is not pro-energy. I've, I've been a fan of Bill's for quite a long time yeah. since he was mayor and still try to keep up with him once in a while. And mm -hmm. so I'd, I'd agree with you. He has a long-term vision mm -hmm. for energy as well. Uh, we had another question that uh, had to do with Houston and the technology and just, uh, you know, how's it changing Houston? 
And so I, I would say that there are a lot of private equity companies here, Dan, that are taking their funds. Maybe they have a billion or a billion and a half dollar fund for investing in uh, resources. Mm -hmm. And they're beginning to look for returns through technology. So they're moving 50, 100 million dollars over to really focus on these, uh, these new emerging technology companies. They're doing it both sort of, I, I won't say that it's angel investing, so they're not taking infinite risk here and uh, spreading it out in, in small amounts, but they're really looking for companies that have a good customer, that they have a product, they have some cash flow, and uh, they're beginning to make a difference in the industry. And we have a number of companies that are emerging uh, that we could talk about one day on the show if you'll come back, because I think there's a great chance to, uh, to really sort of explore what makes them successful, what type of incubator helps them, you know, and, and these PE companies, we've got some of the best and the brightest people in energy, in private equity here in the city. And there's billions of dollars that go to work every day here to, to make this industry work. And technology is a big part of it. I think that's true. And you're also seeing because they've been successful, some outside PE companies are coming into town as well and wanting to spend right. their money here. We're so. seeing a little West Coast money arrive too. <laughs> so, you know, we really appreciate you being here. So, you know, come back and see Energy Factor Fiction and any of the things that we've said, please fact check us. And join us next week on Energy Factor Fiction with John Gibson.